Right. Area Constituency Planning Committee on the 18th of April. Um, just a few housekeeping matters first. Um, members of the public are entitled to attend this meeting as observers. For all those items taken in open session, please note the meeting is being recorded. If you wish to record the meeting yourself, then please give due regard to the Council's protocol on audio visual recording and photography at public meetings. If the fire alarm sounds, please exit the chamber by the emergency exits located to and at the rear of the chamber and congregate in the visitors car park. Ladies and gents, toilets are located in the entrance corridor. Um, this is really for members. Members will be aware that we are in the pre-election period for the York and North Yorkshire mayoral election being held on the 2nd of May. Whilst the business of the council continues, we do need to be mindful of avoiding to give any individual or political group a platform by which they can influence public opinion in the lead into the, by the election. Please, can I ask all members that they are mindful of this during today's proceedings? So that's the general housekeeping done. Um, apologies for absence. I think we're all here, so that's um, a mute point. Uh, minutes of the last meeting. Has every member read the minutes of the last meeting? Is everybody happy? Can I have a proposer and a seconder? Proposed by Councillor Taylor, seconded by Councillor Cross. Thank you very much. Um, any members with declarations of interest? No, I'm going to declare... Oh, yeah, sorry, we're taking general minutes by general affirmation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, declarations of interest. There's none from the floor, but I have two. So item five, I know the uh, parish council chairman speaker who is uh, Fiona Farnell. She was a district councillor. And item six, I know the objector, uh, Mr Stansfield, as he was the member previously a Weldon Parish Council, they are personal, non-prejudicial and non-pecuniary interests. So that's for the record. So thank you. for. Sorry, Caroline, can I just uh, declare, I know Fiona Farnell as well. From yes, right yes, up. indeed. Yeah. Um, item four on the agenda has been withdrawn, but we have Anne with us um, who was leading on that. Do you want to say anything Anne, or not? Thanks Chair. I just wanted to um, confirm that um, the applicant has actually withdrawn that application totally um, and that's because since the application um, was submitted there is a new headmaster at that particular school um, and the school have confirmed that they no longer wish to to progress that proposal for the time being. So um, a decision was made by the school to withdraw the application. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, item five is um, the application 23 oblique 00348 oblique M full update report. And it was the application for the erection of 13 dwellings comprising seven three bedroom dwellings two two-bedroom dwellings and four four-bedroom dwellings in associate, an associated uh, infrastructure, garaging, parking, landscaping, on land off Aston Way, Splix, uh, Slingsby, Moulton, on behalf of WW in Estates. And that's yours, Alan, so thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Can I just say we do have we do have three speakers. I'm not sure they're all here, but we do have three speakers on this. Um, and I'll ask you to come up when we're ready. OK, sorry, Alan, thanks. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Item five is on page 21 of the agenda. The application is brought to committee as an allocated site within the development plan, contributing towards housing supply and because it is considered that significant planning issues have been raised. There are, there are objections and concerns raised by the parish council and a number of local residents. The site was subject of a member's site visit in March and was deferred at the last meeting of committee. There are no updates to the published report. Officers are aware that members have received a third party representation direct from Castle Howard and a subsequent response from the agent for the applicant for the development in front of members today. 
The matters raised by members at the previous meeting of the planning committee have been explored. However, as explained in the update report, the local highway authority is not supportive of the use of the B1257 for residential access. And also Castle Howard Estates Limited have confirmed that they are unwilling to accept an additional court clause within their section 106 agreement to provide unfettered access through their site prior to the occupation of any dwellings. So at this point, I'll just run through the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the presentation was uh, from the previous meeting, but I'll just run through the slides. So the first slide is an aerial photo, and this just outlines the application site um, in red. And so that's the eastern field uh, forming part of the allocation and, and the outline permission. So the field to the west, which has been highlighted in yellow, is the castle, what's referred to as the Castle Howard site. So that was brought before members in January, and that has a resolution for approval subject to a section 106, which hasn't yet been completed. Um, so that relates to 26 dwellings. Uh, so within that uh, slide, I've added a couple of annotations uh, just to show the positions of the various access points. So for the application in front of us today, the um, access that is proposed is off Aspen Way between numbers 12 and 14 Aspen Way. So that's at the northern extent of the site. Um, at the southern extent, extent of that site is proposed that construction traffic would access via the B1257. So that has been confirmed as construction traffic only, uh, no residential traffic, temporary or permanent. Um, and then in relation to the adjacent site, just to reiterate, access arrangements is off um, Aspen Way. So that's to the west of, of the application site in front of us. So that as it stands, that would be construction and residential traffic. Both sites will be subject to a construction management plan which would control um, the traffic and also the creation of the access points and restoration of access points. Um, so the site itself is within development limits, uh, forming part of the allocation uh, for 36 dwellings. So moving on to the next slide, please. We have a photo uh, from Aspen Way facing south. So this is the proposed access between numbers 12 and 14 Aspen Way. Um, so this would re require the removal of the trees that are in the centre of that photo. In terms of the road alignment, it would continue, if you can see on the left hand side, the kerb. Um, so it would be a continuation of that line of, of the road. Um, so it would be to the front of number 14 and to the side of number 12. And just moving on to the next slide. So this is taken from within the Castle Howard site facing uh, uh, east. So this is towards the western boundary of the application site. So the large sycamore tree that you can see is TPO'd and it's to the left hand side of that tree where the access link would be created. Uh, so just moving on to the next slide please. So this is taken from the western boundary of the application site facing north. So that's the, the side elevation of number 14 Aspen Way. And then the next series of photos are just panning round, uh, facing eastward, uh, showing the boundary, the boundary hedge, and then just moving round. Um, and then the next slide, please, just heading towards the southern extent of the site, uh, where you might just be able to make out the field access uh, in the corner of that that um, field. So the next slide is taken from that access point facing north just facing down the site. So it just illustrates the topography, uh, the slope that goes from south uh, to north, falling away, uh, and just illustrates the uh, western boundary uh, and the general sort of scale of the adjacent development to the north. Uh, the next slide is taken from the B1257, um, facing into the construction access. So this would require improvement. This would be secured by condition and then there would be a scheme of downgrading it once um, construction is complete. So that boundary would be closed off, so there'd be no uh, residential access. And the next slide, please. Uh, this is one of the uh, proposed plans, so just to illustrate the layout. So that's um, the, the properties themselves would be orientated to face west, so they would address the adjacent Castle Howard site. The access road would be to the west, uh, to the front of those properties. Um, 
and then I think this is the final slide, uh, which is just um, a, a section um, showing the, the general sort of fall of, of the land, the scale of the properties and, and overall appearance. Um, so plots 12 and 13 are on the right hand side and plots one and two were on the left hand side, just to give you an idea there. And I believe that's the final slide. I think it might be just worthwhile going back to the aerial photo, if possible, Nikki, while I do the presentation. Thank you. So returning to the report itself, the principle of residential development has already been established by the allocation of the land and the site forms part of the adopted local plan. It, the proposal makes a small but important contribution towards the supply of deliverable housing in the locality. The, the site forms part, part of a comprehensive development across the two sites with a vehicular link to the western field opposite plot number four. A secondary access is not prohibited by the adopted site development principles. There are no highways objections to the Aspen Way access, and once the connection from the adjacent site to the west is delivered to the boundary, the access of Aspen Way would be downgraded or returned to the existing. That scheme will be secured by condition. The Aspen Way access unlocks the site for development and allows these 13 dwellings to form part of the allocation to come forward. As set out in the update report, there are conditions relating to the timing of the roadway link connection and the downgrading of the access off Aspen Way. The principal concerns of residents on Aspen Way is the impact during the construction phase and controls will be secured via a robust construction management plan, which is condition 12 on the report. This would direct construction traffic via the B1257 via a temporary improved access and and in addition to the access, a temporary traffic regulation order would be imposed for the B1257, which would impose a reduced speed limit throughout the construction phase. The proposal represents a deliverable housing de development that does not depart from the site development principles set out in the allocation. There are no unacceptable design, highways, amenity or drainage issues, which cannot be made acceptable through the imposition of conditions and a legal agreement. In conclusion, it is therefore recommended that planning permission is granted subject to the completion of a section 106 in respect of affordable housing on site and a commuted sum and also the provision of public open space and the subsequent management and also the 35 conditions as listed in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Alan. Um, I'm going to ask the speakers to come forward, please. Um, the first one is uh, Mr Waring, who is the objector to the proposal. Mr Waring, please come forward. You you have three minutes, Mr Waring, and I think the button for the microphone is at the bottom. Just at the side, beg your pardon. So we'll, we'll, we'll give you a warning at, at when there's 30 seconds left. Out. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Waring. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you may recall from the last meeting that I represent the residents of Aspen Way at Slingsby that are most affected by the development proposals being brought to committee today. Policy SD11 clearly states that the site as a whole is to be developed in a comprehensive manner with a single access of Aspen Way, and this was the foundation of the original outline approval. What is now proposed envisages a temporary access to allow a 13 unit fragmented development with a distinct possibility the suggested second access of Aspen Way could become a permanent arrangement. What happens if the recently constructed 26 unit scheme of Castle Howard does not happen for whatever reason? Or what if it's delayed a few years? Phase two gets built, phase one does not, and the residents of Aspen Way and indeed the wider community in the village then have to suffer the consequences of 13 houses that will stick out like a sore thumb on the edge of the village and adjacent to an AONB, whatever it's called now. This may sound dramatic, but something that could well happen if the application before you is approved in its current form. We're not against the concept of development. The proposal that's before you places great emphasis on the passing reference in policy to possible phasing as the justification for a second access. However, the Aspen Way residents believe, in my opinion, with good reason, that considerably more weighting should be given to the more fundamental elements of policy SD11 
namely a comprehensive scheme with a single access. Additionally, the residents consider a second access of whatever duration would conflict with policy SP20, given that it would, quote, have a material impact on the immunity of users or occupants of the, neighbor, of the neighboring land. Accordingly, the residents of Aspen Way request the planning application before you now is refused, and it's only by doing so would there be an opportunity for the opportunity for there to be a proper reset so that a workable solution can be found to create the comprehensive landmark development that was originally proposed. I would also like to say that the main concern of the residents is not the impact of the construction vehicles. It's simply there should be a single access off Aspen Way. That's all we have to say. Thank you. speaker is Mrs Fiona Farnell, who's the chairman of the parish council at Slingsby. Morning Fiona, you you know the ropes. <laughs> Morning. The Parish Council would like to thank the applicant and agent for trying to overcome the Parish Council and Aspenway residents' concerns around the need for a new access. It is unfortunate, but not unexpected, that the adjacent landowner was unwilling to assist the applicant and thereby the residents of Aspenway. The Parish Council acknowledges that the site has the precedent set for development. It is therefore the hope that once development commences on both sides, common sense prevails and both developers will work together to get the Castle Howard access up and running so the second access is not required, thereby assisting residents of Aspen Way and the community going forward. Thank you. And Mr Butler, who's uh, the agent, I believe, for the uh, project would you like to come forward, Mr Butler? And you have three minutes. We'll give you an audible warning when you've got 30 seconds left. And I think the button's on the side of the mic. Thank you. I think we're on, aren't we? Um, thank you. And just, just going to start by saying thank you for Fiona. And it's been a pleasure to work with the Parish Council and try and overcome these, these concerns. Um, our application today should be judged on its own planning merits. Your officers have informed you that our proposals are in accordance with national and local planning guidance. And your highways officers have confirmed that there are absolutely no justification for refusing the application on highways grounds. This should be the position that you base your decision on today. With regard to the two reasons for deferral last month, your highways officers have confirmed that we cannot use the B1257 as a temporary access for residents. And Castle Howard have confirmed beyond any doubt that they are not willing to accept a clause in their 106 agreement, which requires them to deliver an unfettered access to our site. Which is why we have no option but to include a separate access into our site from Aspen Way. Without the approval of our application, the existing ransom position will remain. And approving our application today is the only way to remove that ransom position as it will secure an alternative access point into our site. And the removal of the ransom strip by approving our application is the only way to deliver what local residents want. The main objections to the scheme are associated with construction traffic from, from using Aspen Way. So we've offered to resolve this concern through the use of the B1257 for construction traffic. Despite there being no objection from highways officers to the use of Aspen Way permanently, we've also agreed to only use it until the link from the Castle Howard site is delivered. Please remember that the full occupation of our scheme would only lead to a very small number of traffic movements, eight per hour at peak time, which is one every eight minutes, which is why there is no objection from your highways officers and why a refusal on highways grounds cannot be justified. I'm really sorry to say this, but, but due to this ransom position, we'd have no option but to appeal the application if it was refused. Your officers will tell you that our chances of success would be success would be high and it'd probably be quicker for us to do that than actually wait for Castle Howard to deliver their link. But we obviously, obviously, obviously don't, don't want to do this and want to avoid that at all costs if we can. You've been told by Castle Howard that they are willing to work with us, which is very much welcomed, but only if the application is approved today which is evidence that our proposed strategy to remove that ransom position will work. Once the ransom position is removed, we fully expect that our site will not reach full occupation before a link from the Castle Howard site is provided. And within months of the connection being made to our site, 
we will reinstate Aspen Way to how it currently looks, a grassed area, if indeed we would need to use Aspen Way at all. This is why approving our applica application today is the best way to deliver everything that the local residents are seeking. It will remove the ransom position, which in turn will enable the delivery of the link between Thank the two you. sites much, much earlier. Again, I'll close by saying that the applicant is a local builder who employs local people and he's ready to develop the site as soon as possible and is currently working through trying to discharge conditions at his own risk before even getting approval because that's how he needs to get on site to keep local jobs and deliver much needed market and affordable homes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, I'll open it up to questions from members. No questions from members. OK, I'll move it into debate then. Councillor Burr. Um, OK, well, um, I'm really, really not happy about the position that we as councillors have been put in today. I feel quite overwhelmed with your speech about it has to be delivered today. We have to make um, sound decisions and we have to think about all that has been presented to us today. So I feel quite overwhelmed that it has to be done today. We are a committee that needs to take stock of this and listen to everything and think about this. Obviously, we all agree that the principle has been established and we all want the housing. That is absolutely fine. But this is a matter of principle on how we have got here. And this was a, a site that was going to be developed as one. And local democracy and local people have their right to put forward their views and state what they would like. So I think that taking our time and really getting this right for everybody is the right way forward. I think that we have a duty to look at the residents' issues regarding Aspen Way. And anyone that has sat on um, a planning committee can understand that when something was first agreed and then it has been changed, we get all the problems, we get all the consequences that we don't want. So I think going back to my principle of what I said some months ago, I was under the impression that it was to be delivered as whole and I'm 100% behind that and support it. But what I'm not 100% behind is the diversion. So for that, I won't be supporting this. I would prefer to, um, you know, you've said that you're going to go to appeal. Well, that's fine. You've, you've told us you're going to go to appeal. So I would like to um, move the um, refusal and I would like to, us to take stock and I would like to think about this seriously because moving forward, this could be an issue that this committee would have to face in the future. So I have no idea if I've got a seconder, but that's what I would like to do because I don't think that this has been resolved. I feel under pressure. I feel that it's got to be done today or we're going to appeal. I don't like that. Democracy is not what this is meant to be. We're a planning application. We're not meant to be put under pressure. So for those reasons, that's what I would like to do, no refusal. Councillor Nutt. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. I mean, the concerns of the residents are, are valid. And I think, you know, we have gone back and, and explored the possibilities. I know that uh, the resident mentioned resetting. If I thought that by refusing this application today, it would reset the entire development, the entire site, should I say, go back to square one and look at it in the whole, um, then I would be uh, minded to do that. The problem is, is it will not reset. It cannot be reset. We have passed the application for the Castle Howard part of the site, and that's it. Now, I, it's very, very unfortunate that in some way there wasn't a clause that said one application has to come forward regardless of the underlying uh, owners. But that's not the case. We've now passed the Castle Howard part. And the Castle Howard, uh, and we've gone back and we've tried to uh, um, work with Castle Howard um, to remove the ransom position and deliver that road in. They won't play ball. That's their legal right. My concern about the 
what the um, developer or the agent has said of that they will take it to appeal. In my experience, sometimes you will find that an inspector on appeal will grant things above and beyond what was on the original application. We could well end up with a situation where the inspector on that day makes the temporary access permanent. So there's a great danger of be careful what you wish for. So with that in mind, and it is, it is unfortunate, it's very unfortunate, but I would support this application. Yeah, I'll propose that we support this application. Councillor Taylor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I take note of what Councillor Burr said. We, we which is that we did defer it last time for further information, which we've had today, and I appreciate that may not be satisfactory for all. But the, the, the principle of development has been established here. We have we have debated this at length. Um, we are a planning committee, and we are here to make decisions. Um, planning is not always black and white, and this is definitely not black and white. There are shades of grey here, and, and that's when it gets emotive. But I think having listened to the officer's report, having listened to the position that we're now in, the fact that the principle of development is established, I am now in a position where I can support the application and I will second Councillor Napton's proposal. Thank you, Councillor Turbler. Anybody else? I, I'm going to say from the chair, I'm, I accept entirely uh, Councillor Burr's views and I also accept the residents' views. But we are in a really difficult position because the principle of development is already established. What we're talking about is the access. And I think we have a workable solution for that access for this scheme to go ahead. And I would be uncomfortable with the suggestion that we refuse it today and allow it to go to appeal. As Councillor Napton says, that then we may lose control of what those conditions may be. And it may also come at a significant cost to the authority. And I, I don't think there are sufficient grounds to, to validate um, Councillor Burr's suggestion to refuse the application. So if nobody else wishes to speak, I'm going to move it to the vote because it's been proposed and seconded for approval. Is everybody happy with that? OK, can we vote, please, members? Four. We're voting for. Thank you. Councillor Burr, against. That's six votes for and one against. Nikki, thank you. That's determined. Thank you. Uh, members, before I move us on, you'll find on your desks um, a letter which has been received from the objector to the next application, Mr Stansfield. Um, I wondered if you'd like time to read it for, for two or three minutes before we move on to the application itself. Thank you.
OK, are members happy for us to proceed? OK, thank you very much. Um, just before we proceed, I should declare that actually I should have done this at declarations and I didn't, so apologies. I am a member of the Howardian Hills area, uh, no, National Landscapes Joint Advisory Committee, but I take no part in any um, planning decisions that are made by that committee. But it, so it's just a, for in, an informative, personal, non-prejudicial, non-pecuniary interest. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, Alan, do you want to present your um, report? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Item six is on page 57 of the agenda. The application in front of members is subject to a relatively high number of representations from local residents and the application raises significant planning issues that warrant consideration by the Council's planning committee. The site was the subject of a member's site visit in March and was deferred at the last meeting of committee. Members will have noted that in the late pages uh, there was one further representation and there is also the one representation that's been circulated in hard copy this morning, uh, which members have just had the opportunity to read. I will, I will return to that representation later in my presentation. Um, there are no other updates to the published report, so I'll just move on to the PowerPoint presentation and just the slides relating to this, the site. Uh, the first is an aerial photo with the application site outlined in red. Uh, so the, the premises is on the southern side of the main road through the village. Um, it's within the conservation area, it's within the uh, national landscape area uh, and also within the development limits. Um, so as you can see, it's a predominantly residential area uh, opposite the premises to the uh, northwest is the Crown and Cushion public house. Uh, the village hall is to the east uh, just off um, that aerial photo and obviously the, the main road links to the A64 to the east. Um, you might also be able to make out the service road which runs to the front of the premises, uh, runs parallel to the public highway um, and that is uh, a private uh, road itself that serves a number of premises, residential and business. So moving on to the next slide please. So this is just looking at the, the front of the property um, and on the left hand side I've just summarised the existing uh, restrictions that apply in terms of the hours of the evening events and the number of events um, and also the arrangements in terms of ticketing and maximum number of people allowed to attend the evening events. Um, so those would be unchanged and carried forward and there's also the proposal for an evening event management plan as detailed in the report. So moving on to the next slide, it, this is again just showing the frontage of the premises, which is the, the obviously the property that's um, gable side on to the to the public highway. Um, as you can see, there is the service road to the front and uh, an access um, that goes under an archway to the left hand side of, of the premises. Um, so as referred to in the report, there is a TRO for double yellow lines on the southern side of the road. So that's where the grass verge is, um, just as shown on that photo. Those double ye yellow lines are due to be installed this summer. So uh, just a number of photos within the premises. This is the existing sort of area which is used as a cafe towards the rear, uh, just to give an idea of the, the general seating arrangements. And just panning round. And, and that would be unchanged. And just, I think this might be the final slide. This is just to outline uh, the area uh, which is referred to in a condition, which is the license area. So this is the area of the building which is um, permitted for the evening events. Uh, so it's the um, area to the front and the area which comprises the cafe itself. Uh, and I believe that's the final one. I think it might be just worth keeping that one on, on screen. Thank you, Nikki. So returning to the report itself, um, the shop, cafe and hot food takeaway premises is in mixed use within use classes E and sui generis for the hot food takeaway element. In April 2023, the premises obtained planning permission to hold 10 evening events per year on the basis of no more than one event per month. The evening events fall under use class E and do not represent a change of use. The evening events are those food and drink based functions occurring after normal opening hours until 10.30pm on a set number of days throughout the calendar year. 
permission is sought for a 50 a year limit at uh, 50 a year uh, number of events with no monthly limit. All existing restrictions set by the extant planning permission would continue to apply, such as the maximum number of people allowed to attend each event, event, the use of a ticketing system, the music cut off time and uh, no hot food takeaway. The applicant is agreeable to operate in compliance with their evening event management plan, which is summarised within the substantive report. This would control the spacing of events and seeks to limit the intensity of the impact. After considering the delivery information provided by the applicant and liaising with the council's planning solicitor, it is considered that the continued imposition of a condition which allows deliveries to the premises as early as four o'clock in the morning would not be necessary or justifiable. In the interest of ensuring no unreasonable impacts on residential amenity, it is therefore recommended that the condition should be varied, as suggested by the applicant, to restrict deliveries to not before uh, 6, uh, 6 a.m. In terms of residential amenity, there are a number of local objections, as, as members are aware. Um, it should be noted that there are no record of complaints for the evening events that have been held to date throughout 2023. The EHO, uh, the Council's EHO notes potential adverse impacts. Um, that, uh, the EHO notes potential adverse impact, but the proposal can be made acceptable by virtue of the evening event management plan and conditions shall provide scope for future review of that review approved plan. In terms of the Hawadian Hills National Landscape, it is considered that whilst tranquility is undoubtedly one of the special qualities of the National Landscape, officers of the LPA do not share the concern of the AUMB officer for the reasons set out in paragraph 10.27 of the substantive report. The additional evening events would not undermine the character of the village or be incompatible with the existing tranquility of this part of the national landscape. With regard to highways, um, the traffic regulation order is noted, but ultimately the highways officer does not consider that the additional opening on an increased number of evenings across the year would change the on-street parking de demand to a level that would be significantly detrimental to the operational capacity and safety of the highway, provided the conditions uh, are imposed. So to conclude, it's recommended that planning permission is granted subject to the 13 conditions as listed in the report. But as mentioned, I would like to just return uh, to the um, representation that's been circulated to members this morning, and I'll just read out a statement in respect to that. Members have read a written objection from the registered speaker, which was submitted to the LPA at the start of this week. The representation expresses the view that the report for this application is misdirecting and, ref and refers to the possibility of a judicial review. Planning officers and legal officers of the Council have considered the points raised and do not consider that they give rise to any grounds for challenge and for clarity they will be addressed as part of this statement. The objection refers to the extant permission for the application site being from 2009. That is a permission reference 09 double zero two four one slash FUL, whereas in fact it is the permission, the most recent permission, which has the reference two three slash triple zero double seven slash seven three, which was granted in in 2023. Members will be aware that a successful section 73 application results in the grant of a new planning permission in which the conditions attached to the previous permission are either carried over, varied or removed. Therefore, the relevant conditions for varying and carrying over are those attached to the permission granted last year. The current permission for this site includes condition number two, which covers the operating hours and permitted exceptions for evening events. Condition five limits evening events to be held within a licensed area, as shown on the slide, um, which relates to an approved floor plan drawing. Condition number seven, which provides for the development to be carried out in accordance with an approved drawing, that delineates respective floor space for the retail and cafe uses. These conditions would ensure that the cafe and retail uses are both operational during daytime hours and, and that they take place in the allocated areas on the ground floor. But for the evening events, both areas can be used for the cafe use. This is considered compatible for the reasons 
with the reason for imposing condition seven, which is listed on the decision notice as to ensure that the preparation area and tea room do not encroach on the retail area. Obviously, the risk of encroachment is not engaged during evening events. For the avoidance of doubt, all of these conditions are currently in effect and are not a new proposal. The objection suggests the floor area allocated for evening events is a change of use amounting to development, whereas actually it is a permitted use under the existing mixed use permission and the floor area used for evening events is in accordance with condition five of the planning permission. The objection also suggests that there is a breach of condition occurring within the retail area deline delineated by condition seven. The council's enforcement officers do not have any live cases open for this site, but will duly investigate any reported potential breaches of planning control. However, there are none at present, and even if there were, there would, they would not preclude the determination of the current application before members, which is for an amendment to the number of evening events permitted by condition two. So that concludes my presentation at this point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Alan. Um, just for clarity, this is um, application ZE23 oblique 069. 5, 5 oblique 7 3 update report application for the variation of condition 2 of planning approval 2 3 oblique 007 oblique 7 3 dated the 18th of April 2023 to remove the restriction on the number of evening events per month and to allow an increase in the total number of evening events from 10 to 50 occasions per calendar year on land at Doe Main Street Welburn on behalf of Mrs. Georgia Dowks White. So that's just to clarify. Um, I am going to um, call forward the speakers now, if that's uh, okay with you, everybody. And the first speaker is Mr. Stansfield. Mr. Stansfield, if you'd like to come forward, the button to turn the mic on is at the side. You have three minutes, and at 30 seconds, I'll give you 30 seconds remaining. I'll give you a warning that you're nearer to time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stansfield. Thank you. Um, before I start on the statement that I've had prepared, I challenge what has been said about use class E3. Um, it cannot be used in this case because there is a pre-existing planning condition uh, that goes back to the 2009 consent, refer, uh, which uh, refers to the use of the premises and therefore E3 cannot be applied in this case, and I think you'll find there's plenty of case law to support that view. If I could continue with the statement I have prepared. One year ago, following an agreement between myself and the applicant regarding special events, the planning officer decided it was necessary to protect neighbours and community by limiting events to 10 per annum with no more than one per month to comply with policy SP20. We find it a rational reasoning that a limit of 50 events per year now becomes acceptable and yet still neighbours amenity remains protected and policy compliance remains. Um, the points that I would like to raise are that this is a section 73 application seeking only to vary a condition that the existing permitted use of the premises is as approved in 2009 this approval defining on a plan the protected retail area insisted upon by the forward planning officer to comply with policy to safeguard village shopping facilities. That the applicant has not applied for a change of use to the approved 2009 consent, nor could they under a section 73 application. That the consequence of approval would be that recommending condition 05 consents to a change of use of the 200, 2009 protected retail area referred to as the license area. Although this has not been applied for and cannot be applied for or granted under a section 73 application. That the planning officers were notified of an existing continuing breach, which at the site inspection they failed to recognize. Unless members are confident that the above points are not valid and not applicable to this application, then we cannot see that this recommendation can be approved. We suggest recommended conditions 5, 05 and 07 are in direct contradiction. The balance of comments submitted by villagers suggests that a 500% increase in these late openings is not what people who live here wish to see. 
some media generated comments from a far afield from far afield of no empathy with a well burned sense of place which the AOMB National Landscapes now recognise in their objection and which the NPF and ourselves seek to protect. The planning law, planning policy, and all material planning considerations are the benchmark for planning decisions. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan Cuthbert, one of the directors at DOE. At the last committee meeting, queries were raised about the delivery schedule for the cafe, as well as how our proposal would impact parking in the village. This information has been provided to the committee ahead of time, however, we would like to summarise for you. The main concern about deliveries was the current condition which states we may receive deliveries from 4am. This was highlighted as inappropriate for the business, as it could cause too much disturbance to the village following a bistro night. We absolutely agree with the committee on this and would like to highlight that one of our deliveries um, we absolutely agree with the committee on this and would like to highlight that none of our deliveries arrive before 6 a.m. with most arriving between our working hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We would be more than happy to amend the condition to state that deliveries will not be allowed before 6 a.m. and to support this we have sought written confirmation from our earlier suppliers stating that they will not deliver to us before 6. We feel that this would be more appropriate condition for our business needs and would mitigate disruption to the direct neighbours of the cafe. We'd also like to point out that the information given to the council regarding our delivery schedule represents every possible delivery we could receive. However, we do not receive deliveries on every single day and only when we need to stock replenishing. An average week of deliveries for us looks like one to two deliveries Monday to Friday and one every other Saturday or every Saturday. Please do bear in mind that we are a food business and limiting the deliveries that we would receive would have a catastrophic effect on our ability to run the business. For the issues with parking, unfortunately, the cafe does not have a private car park and therefore attendees of the bistro nights would have to park on the main road. However, it is not unreasonable for our um, customers to use the available on-street parking in the village. We feel that these events will take place in the evening this should not cause too much disruption as all cars from visitors during the day will have left the village by this time. However, to ensure that further issues are not caused, we have spoken with the manager at the Crown and Cushion pub who has verbally stated that employees of Doe may use their car park during bistro evenings. This will remove some additional cars from the main road and free up spaces for the bistro guests. In addition, we have also amended our website to include information about parking in a how to get to us section and have clearly requested that vis visitors park considerately, taking care not to block any driveways or park on the service roads. This information will also be included in the email communications that we send out regarding tickets for these events. We hope that this will bring attention to parking issues with the village and ensure that our, our um, customers do not cause any issues with in inappropriate parking on these evenings. We'd also like to highlight that today there have been no complaints from any member of the public to do regarding parking on the beach road evenings and we are aware of no incidents where um, customers of the beach road nights have parked on the service roads or blocked any driveways. Finally, we would like to address queries about the land to the rear of Doe and whether this could be used for parking. The cafe is rented and therefore has no right to any land other than the ground floor space that we use. The land to the rear of the cafe really is owned by Cherry Bear. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask if there's anything you want to come back on as a result of those comments, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in relation to the first speaker and just to um, uh, sort of reiterate the, the, the officer's uh, position in respect of the, uh, the planning permissions and the reference to the 2009 permission. Um, the applicant is operating under the permission granted last year, which is granted under Section 73, which results in a grant of a new planning permission. That permission established the acceptability of evening events. Obviously, it limited it to a certain number, um, but it doesn't present a change of use uh, concern. It falls within the same use class. Um, so, so it's really just to underline that 
the section 73 that is being um, operated by the, the premises is the one that was granted last year. I'll open it up for questions, Councillor Napton. Thank you, Chairman. I just wondered, um, the applicant has stated that um, there's a verbal agreement with the Crown and Cushing for uh, uh, staff members to use the, the, the Crown and Cushing's car park um, on event nights. Can that be conditioned? Uh, the officer's opinion on that is that um, it, it's not necessary to make it acceptable. It's it's an additional voluntary uh, agreement between uh, the pub and, and the premises. So it's not something in light of the highways comments, um, we wouldn't pursue that in terms of trying to reach an agreement, which could be difficult, difficult to enforce. Um, so it's very much just a, an added um, voluntary arrangement from from the applicant. Councillor Burr. Thanks for your um, excellent appraisal, um, very thorough. Um, please, could you just reiterate um, the double yellow lines? I just didn't quite catch that, please, when they were, were going down. And then I've got another question for Alpha. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. So the uh, double yellow lines, the TRO is in place. Um, it's due to be sealed uh, as part of the legal process shortly. So that those, they will be, it's anticipated they will be in place this summer. Um, so that would affect um, a few positions within the village on the main street, but principally in relation to this application site, it would be the land to the front of the premises on public highway. And my second question is, um, I'd like some legal advice, please. Um, we have heard from a speaker um, an allegation about <coughs> us as a council that, you know, um, we are not moving forward with the, the the right conditions and I would just like the legal advice so that when we make our decision we know that we've been given legal advice that we are able to make a decision on the facts. Thank you. Um, that's fine. Um, there were a number of references to the 2009 permission. I think Alan's confirmed a couple of times that's not the current permission it's been superseded several times now actually because there's been a number of section 73 applications over the years and each time one of those is approved it grants a new permission which has a, a set of conditions some of which will be carried forward some of which will have been varied um so the the ones which are before members today for consideration are the conditions which are attached to the permission granted last year and all of those conditions which have been referred to, they're, they're live conditions. That's the fallback permission. The use for evening events, that's an existing permitted use. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, th I think it was just really right for you to point that out. That's what how I understood it. But thanks, that's conclusive and that's quite helpful. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, condition five. I'm a little bit concerned that the red area does not include the toilet area. Yeah, that, that is a correct observation. Um, Noticing the the toilet is accessible from outside, um, I well I'm not sure, Chair. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I suppose the the arrangements. The operator would obviously allow attendees to use the toilet. Um, I think I think the, the the key thing about that, the purpose of that plan, is to show where people will be seated for the event, um, so that you know it, it could be monitored in future. Um, so yeah, that is that is a correct observation. Anyone else? No. So. 
um, this is my area. This is my patch, sorry. Um, and there are a number of issues. Um, thank you for clarifying and altering the uh, condition which allows deliveries at four o'clock in the morning. I, I never believed that was um, appropriate and I'm far happier with the six o'clock, although I would like to have seen it a little later, but I won't pick the bones out of that one. Um, with regard to the car parking, I still have concerns. However, given that there will be, I, I think it's double yellow lines, is it not? Double yellow lines on the road in front of the business where parking will not be allowed. I think it's really incumbent on the operators to make sure that nobody parks on the service road and that will be a, a problem for you um, and not for the council, but it may come back to us if that's an issue. Um, reluctantly, and it is very reluctantly because I'm not sure that this is the right thing for the village, I will move approval, but I'm, I'm still very unhappy with it. Um, and it, I will watch what develops in the next few months um, because I am so uncomfortable with this. And I don't know if that's seconded. Councillor Napton. I'll second that, Chairman. So, members, it's moved and seconded for approval. Can we please go to the vote? That's six four. One again. Oh, you're going to uh, cancel the Burr abstains. So that is approved. Subject. Um, the next item on the agenda is any other business. I don't have anybody. Any. Thank you. Um, the next meeting is the 23rd of May and. Could we just stay behind? Because I think Nikki wants to discuss the setup of what we've got and whether you're comfortable with it or not. Nikki, sorry. So I'm going to close the meeting at two minutes to 11. Thank you, members.